I didn't know it was going to be time to preach right then. (laughs) Wonderful to see you all this evening. Glad to be here on this Monday night. And I have prepared a message to preach this evening that I've entitled, The Greatest Sentence Ever Written. In my opinion, the greatest sentence ever written is, of course, found in the greatest book ever written, the Bible, God's Holy Word. And in my opinion, the greatest sentence found in the Word of God has only three words in it. All three words are monosyllables. One word has four letters, one word has three letters, and one word has but two letters. God is love. It's found in 1 John 4, 8. And for me, there is so much truth in those three little words, the greatest sentence ever written, that the world's greatest scholars have been pondering the meaning of those words for the past 20 centuries. Entire volumes have been written by scholars trying to explain the depth of the meaning of those three words. God is love. Someone has recorded the story about Dwight Moody building the church building in Chicago, Illinois. And they say that when Mr. Moody built that church building, he earnestly desired that everybody who would come to that church building would know that God is love. And so he hired a painter to paint those three words and hang them above the pulpit. Now, Moody said, everybody who comes to this church building will know that God is love. One night... An old drunkard staggered off the streets of Chicago into that church building. He sat down on the back row and looked up and through his bleary bloodshot eyes, he saw that sign hanging above the pulpit. After reading it, he started muttering to himself, That's not true. God is not love. That's not true. God is not love. And he was obviously disturbing the congregation with his muttering. And so one of the deacons came over and tapped him on the shoulder and said, Shh, you're disturbing the church. Either be quiet or get up and leave. And so the old drunk got up out of his seat and staggered back out onto the streets of Chicago muttering as he stumbled along, God is not love. God is not love. And then he muttered, if God were love, he would love an old drunk like me. And suddenly the tears began to flow down the cheeks of this old drunkard, and he changed his words, and he began to say, God is love. It seemed as though the Holy Spirit of God had used His own message, the greatest sentence ever written, to penetrate the cold heart of this hardened sinner. He continued muttering, God is love. God is love. As he stumbled down the streets of Chicago back to the church building, And inside he went and again sat on the back row. But this time he sat there staring up at that sign and the tears ran from his cheeks as though it was a flow of water out of a pitcher. It even disturbed Dwight Moody who was standing behind the pulpit preaching until he stopped preaching. And Mr. Moody walked back to the back row and compassionately put his arm around this old drunkard and he asked, What have I preached to cause you to weep like this? 
the old drunk shook his head and said, Mister, I haven't heard one word that you preached. And Dwight Moody said then, Why are you weeping like this? And the old drunk pointed to the sign hanging above the pulpit, and he said, That message has broken my heart. Dear brothers and sisters, I am praying tonight that as I say the words of the greatest sentence ever written over and over again, that it may penetrate all of our hearts this evening and that we may all have the same feeling that that old drunkard had years ago when he said, God is love with a broken heart, really believing that God loved a drunkard like himself. There are many ways that God has proven his love for us. And I want to cite some of those ways this evening from the scriptures themselves. First of all, God proves his love for us by pardoning us of all of our sins in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7 the Bible says let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will freely pardon God proves his love for us by being willing to pardon us of every sin that we have committed. Many times when we attempt to bring this message to people, they will say, no, God can never forgive me of my sins. I've had many people to tell me that during my lifetime. God can never forgive me. And when I try to convince them, they will usually say, Preacher, you have no idea how wicked I really am. And I've had some people to say, I know it comes as a shock to you, but I am a murderer. I've even spent time in the penitentiary. God will never forgive me of that sin. But what do we read in the scriptures? On the day of Pentecost, thousands of people were gathered there who were guilty of murder. The apostle Peter preached to them and he said, God has made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the murderers of Jesus cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. More than 3,000 believed the word of God, repented of their sins, accepted Jesus, were baptized that very day, and had the joy of their sins being forgiven. Even the sin of murder, as horrible as it is. I've had other people say, you have no idea what a wicked sinner I am. Why, if you knew the sins that I'd committed, you would understand that God could never forgive me. Why, I have even worked against the church. I have even persecuted the church. And what do we read in the scriptures? Saul of Tarsus, one of the greatest enemies Jesus ever had, was persecuting the church of Christ. And what could be any worse sin than persecuting the very body of Jesus and yet Jesus met this man on the road to Damascus, confronted him face to face in a blinding flash of light, 
And the scriptures tell us how Saul of Tarsus fell on his knees in the midst of that blinding light and he heard the voice of Jesus asking him this question, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul asked the Lord Jesus directly, what do you want me to do? Jesus said, you go into the city and a man will come and tell you what to do. Saul was blinded by the light, but was guided by the men who were with him into the city. And there he prayed for three days and three nights while waiting for that man that Jesus said would come and tell him what to do to be saved. And at the end of the three days of waiting, here came one Ananias. And what did he tell him to do? Acts 22, 16. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And Saul, the former enemy of Jesus, persecutor of the church, was forgiven of his sin of persecuting the church of Christ and became the great Apostle Paul. It is very easy for someone to say, oh, I don't know how God could ever forgive a sinner like me if you only knew what I was guilty of. But my friend, you cannot commit any sin that God cannot forgive. God is willing to forgive you of anything that you have ever done wrong if you will repent and obey Him and follow in the steps of Jesus. And that's one way that God proves that God is love. But there's a second way that God proves that He is love. And that is by taking account of our sins and disciplining us when we do sin. Let me read again from the Word of God in Hebrews chapter 12, 5 and 6. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when He rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those He loves, and He punishes everyone He accepts as a son. You know, when I thank God that I was born in a Christian home. Every day of my life, I thank God for my dear Christian mother and father. My mother and father loved me enough to discipline me. Sometimes when I was a little boy, I was very naughty. And when I was naughty, my mother would say, Bend over, Reggie. And so I would bend over, and she'd go, Whoop! Whoop! And... I would cry, pretend. I didn't, didn't really cry because my mother was a little tiny lady. She didn't even weigh 100 pounds. Little tiny hand. She couldn't hurt a big strong boy like me. But oh, I pretended like she half killed me as I would weep and wail. And then I would run outside and laugh. Well, one day, my mother disciplined me, and I really hooped and hollered and shed crocodile tears, and then I ran outside and laughed and said, Ha, ha, you couldn't hurt me. And I didn't realize that my mother had followed me outside. She heard what I said, and the next thing I knew, I heard her saying, Oh! Okay, Reggie, you wait till your daddy gets home. Wow. I knew I was in bad trouble because my father was a great, big, strong man with big muscles. And worst of all, he had a big stick that he hid up over the doorway, above the door jamb. And whenever I was bad... He used that stick on my bare legs and it stung like fire. I hated that stick. And when I heard my mother speak those words, oh boy, I was afraid. I ran off to the nearest tree and I climbed the tree and I said, I'm going to hide.
from my daddy. I'm not going to let him switch me with that switch today. And so all afternoon I stayed up in that tree hiding. When my daddy came home from work, I could hear my mother, even though I was outside in the backyard up in the tree, as she told my daddy what a naughty boy I'd been. I could hear her going yakety yakety yak and Reggie this and Reggie that. And then I heard her say, you need to get that switch after that boy. And the next thing I knew, my daddy was standing in the doorway and I saw he had that terrible switch in his hand and he shouted, Reggie, get yourself over here. And I came trembling and shaking before my daddy. He said, pull up your pant leg and show your bare skin. And wham, wham, went that switch. Oh, those red stripes on my legs burned like fire. And I cried, not pretend. I really cried. And I was angry. And I ran outside and I muttered, I hate my father. I hate my mother. And I'm running away from home. And I did. Guess how long I was gone? at least two hours because you can imagine what happened <laughs> I got hungry yes. <laughs> I had to come back because I was hungry <laughs> now as I grew into an adult you know what happened to me I changed my mind when I was a little boy and my mother would spank me well I thought she hated me and when my daddy took that switch, I knew he hated me. But when I grew up, I began to realize that they love me. And I realized that every time my mother took her little hand and whopped me, it was because she loved me so much. There was no doubt in my mind that my mother loved me. No doubt in my mind that my daddy loved me. And today, every day of my life, I thank God for the loving discipline that my mother and father gave me when I deserved it so much. Without that discipline, I'd probably be in the penitentiary right now because I learned obedience from that discipline. I learned to respect the law from that discipline that my parents gave me. And so God demonstrates His love for us and proves His love to us by disciplining us when we stray away from Him. In the third place, I want to point out from the Scriptures that God proves His love by sympathizing with us. And the scripture I've chosen for this is Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9. In all of their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Our God is a sympathizing Heavenly Father. What a beautiful picture Isaiah presents there in Isaiah 63 of the love of God. When we cry, God cries. When our heart is broken, God's heart is broken. When we suffer, God suffers with us. And just like a loving father will go and pick up his weeping child in his arms and comfort that child and carry that child to bed and tuck him in and give him a good night kiss. So our God shows his love toward us because of his sympathy for us. You know, I started preaching when I was only 16 years of age. I became the minister of the North Miami Christian Church at North Miami, Oklahoma at the age of 16 
and preached for that church the next two years, all during my junior and senior year in high school. While I was there, we did have a death or two in the church. And you can imagine how inadequate I felt as a young boy going to visit the members of the church and trying to offer sympathy. I can remember one family in particular, and when the husband died unexpectedly, I went to the home and spoke to the grieving wife and children and said, I sympathize with you. And I could just sense that mother and wife looking at me as if they were saying, why, what do you know about sympathy? How can you sympathize? You're just a boy. You have your father and mother. You've not lost your parents in death. You have your grandparents. You have all of your relatives and family members. You've never experienced anything like what we're going through. What do you mean saying you sympathize with us? I felt so inadequate. But now the years have gone by, many years. And in fact, the other day my wife and I sat down and made a list. And it was shocking to both of us to list the names of 32 members of our family that we have buried. All of our great-grandparents we've buried. All of our grandparents we've buried. Our parents we've buried. Cousins and aunts and uncles we've buried. And even my oldest son, Terry, that many of you remember, I've buried Terry. And you know today, when someone has trouble or they're grief-stricken, and I go visit them and say, you know, I know just how you feel. I've come to sympathize with you. People nod their head and said, yes, you understand. You understand what we're going through. It makes a difference, doesn't it, when somebody understands. But some of you are probably saying, nobody, nobody in the whole world understands what I'm going through right now. Nobody understands my grief. Nobody understands my troubles. But I'm here to tell you, there is one who does understand. Our God in heaven, who is a God of love, is also a God of sympathy. And God understands what you are going through right now. And God is sympathetic with you. There's a fourth way in which God proves His love. We find this in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. God has proven His love by adopting us into His royal family we are children of God. Just suppose that you were a poor orphan, all alone in this world, with no father or mother, no grandparents, no cousins, aunts, or uncles, nobody to take care of you. Just suppose that you were hungry. Suppose you were naked and homeless and crouched beside the road, shivering in the cold. And suppose the Queen of England, whom I am told is the richest person in the whole world. I read somewhere that the Queen of England is worth billions, and billions of dollars. Just suppose the Queen of England would drive by in her Royal Mercedes uh, Queen's automobile, whatever it is. And suppose she would order the driver to stop. 
roll the window down and say, Come, my child, come and sit with me in the queen's chariot. Come with me to London, to Buckingham Palace. Come with me and eat food at the queen's table. Come and sleep in one of the palace bedrooms because I want to adopt you and make you my child. And when I die, you will share in the inheritance of my other children. What would you say? Why, if you were a poor orphan child in a pitiful condition like I described, I'll bet you that you would kneel before the queen and you would say, thank you, thank you, thank you, my majesty. You would be so grateful. It would be unbelievable to be treated that way. But I'm here to tell you of something a thousand times greater than that. The one true great God in heaven who created heaven and earth, who created each one of us, who gives us the very air that you breathe, the God who owns all of the silver and gold and paves the streets of heaven with gold, loves you. And if you're a Christian, he has adopted you into his royal family and made you a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And if you're not a Christian, he wants to adopt you. He's willing to adopt you if you'll just give yourself to him willingly in obedience. In the fifth place, there's one more proof that I want to submit from the Bible to prove that God is love. And that's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Some translations use the word sacrificed. You know, to sacrifice is, I suppose, the greatest test of love. God so loved you that He sacrificed His one and only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. The sacrifice of Jesus proves God loves you and God is love. There's a story told about a man who was a drawbridge switchman this great bridge spanned a river like the Ohio River or like the Mississippi River. I'm sure that all of us have crossed a great bridge at one time or another that would span one of the huge rivers of America. This was a railway bridge. Now this bridge was so constructed that it would raise up in the middle and go way up in the air on each side. The purpose of raising the railway bridge was to allow big ships to go up and down the river. If you've ever lived along the river like the Ohio River, you've watched those great ships go up and down the Ohio River, great barges. If you've ever been on the Mississippi River, why you have seen those mighty ships and barges going up and down the Mississippi carrying hundreds of tons of goods and you have wondered at such an amazing sight. And so you can understand why it would be necessary to raise a bridge to allow a ship to go through. And so it was this bridge keeper's job to control that switch at all times, to be sure the bridge was down when a railway train wanted to cross, to be sure the bridge was up when a ship wanted to go up or down the river. This bridge gatekeeper had a little boy, six years old, and this little boy just loved to come to work with his daddy because he liked to watch his daddy press that switch and see those great electric motors turn and watch 
the two spans of that bridge go up in the air. And he liked to watch his daddy press the switch again and put the bridge down. He loved to see the sh ship sailing up and down the river. And he watched always to see the time when a train would roar across that bridge and cross the river. One day, the little boy was at work with his daddy. And his daddy had the bridge up because there was a ship that was coming down. And while the father was preoccupied with his job, the little boy disobeyed his daddy and went outside the workman's shack where all this electrical apparatus was. And he crept around to where one span of this bridge was sticking way up in the air. And he began to climb up, just like you would climb a ladder, a very terribly dangerous thing to do. Something that his father had warned him never to do. His father had warned him to never go near that bridge. But he disobeyed. He was having such an exciting time. And he climbed all the way to the top. Just about the time the little boy reached the top of that span of the bridge, the father heard the railway train whistling and he knew it was the fast-moving passenger train coming. More than 600 passengers were riding on that train, depending upon him to put the bridge down. Quickly, the switchman leaped to the switch box and pressed the button, and the electric motors immediately started turning, and the bridge slowly started coming down. And then all at once, the switchman was horrified when he heard the piercing scream of his son, Daddy, help me, Daddy, help me, Daddy. He ran outside the workman's shack and looked up and there saw his own son clinging perilously to the bridge as it was coming down. What would he do if he stopped the bridge and saved his son over 600 people would plunge into the river and drown. If he put the bridge down, he was going to have to sacrifice his own son. Because it was his duty, he stayed there holding his thumb on the switch, bringing the bridge together. It was a ghastly, horrible sight as the bridge came together and broke the body of that little boy and the blood of his son flowed into the river. Oh, dear friends, let's change the scene for just a second and take a look at Calvary. God did the same thing. God sacrificed His Son, Jesus, in order to save you. Why did God do that? Because God is love. Yes, He loves you. Do you love Him? Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. So it's very clear. If you love, He's proven His love for you. But now the question is, do you love Him? If you do, you will believe His word. If you do, you will repent of your sins. If you do, you will confess His name publicly. If you do, you will obey Him in baptism. If you do, you will live the Christian life and serve Him all the days of your life through His body, the church. It's just as simple as that. We're going to extend the invitation to those who need to come tonight and obey Him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank You for Your great love. Love that was so great that you were willing to sacrifice your only son, Jesus. We pray for any man or woman, any boy or girl that's in this audience that has not 
accepted and obeyed. Help them to make that decision right now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Shall we sing? Will you come right on the first verse as we sing it together? Oh.